I'd like to formally acknowledge where we are, the Treaty 6 territory of Canada, um, also called Saskatoon, and also the traditional homeland of the Métis. And I bring this up as a, as a reflection of my role in reconciliation, both as an employee of the public library where everyone is welcome, and that's a main tenant of, of our institution. And personally, as someone who has lived in Saskatchewan her whole life and feels a responsibility to my neighbors and the people I live with to do my best by them. So I think that is all of the um, SPL piece that I wanted to cover. Carol, I hand it over to you now to um, introduce our speaker. Okay, um, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Sustainability Speaker Series presentation for January. My name is Carol Chubb and I'm a volunteer with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The Environmental Society delivers community education, undertakes research, and carries out demonstration projects that move us towards sustainability. We have been operating since 1970 on important issues such as sustainable energy and climate solutions, water protection, biodiversity preservation, and reduction of toxic substances in our environment. If you're not already a member, we encourage you to join and you can always find out more about our diverse projects, activities, and how to get involved by checking out our website, www.environmentalsociety.ca. If you would like to receive an email notification of events in the Sustainability Speaker Series, you can send an email to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Uh, the email address is info at environmentalsociety.ca. And in your email message, ask to be put on the list of people to be notified of events in the Sustainability Speaker Series. Our speaker this evening is Catherine Baudin. Catherine is passionate about local food and reducing food waste. Catherine is an entrepreneur. She holds a chartered public accountant designation and she is CEO and a co-owner of the company's Zesty Kits and Cookie Kits. She has conducted cooking workshops and she can give us tips on easy ways to reduce the food waste at home. Catherine works to transform industries through collaboration, supporting local economies, environmental consciousness, and wholesome food experiences. Her company, Zesty Kits, won the 2020 Saskatchewan Waste Minimization Award for Small Business. Tonight, Catherine's presentation is on local food and reducing food waste. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, Megan, I don't know if you want to put the, yeah, there we go, the presentation's up here. Perfect. Oh, well, thank you so much, Carol. And it's really a pleasure to speak uh, at the Sustainability Speaker Series. Um, as Carol mentioned, I grew up with a passion for local food. Annie, my sister, and I started Zesty Kits three years ago to share our passion for cooking local food and reducing food waste. Uh, so we can go to the next slide to go a little bit over um, the topics we will discuss today. So there's three main uh, topics I want to talk about. First, we'll talk about why discuss, uh, reducing food waste at home is important. So we'll briefly discuss the Canada Food Price uh, Report for 2022. We'll talk about five different tips to reduce food waste at home. And we will go over um, a soup recipe. I call it the happy fridge recipe because it sounds a lot better than the empty fridge uh, soup recipe. Then we'll talk about easy tips to reduce 
our food um, expenses at home, specifically in terms of meat. Uh, in the last year, meat has increased a lot in price. Um, and uh, there's a surprising advantage to buying meat locally that I wanna share with you. Then I'll talk about three different tips to reduce our meat expense, including um, some recipes and a special bison stew recipe that um, is, it has some, uh, some really fun, um, um, some really fun things about it. So uh, I guess the story behind that bison stew recipe a few months ago, uh, we rented a house um, when our floors were getting refinished at home. And uh, it was like just when uh, it was getting colder outside and I made this stew recipe and after eating it, like I was really cold before and after eating it, everybody who ate it felt really warm. So it's a really heartwarming uh, bison stew recipe. So I'm excited to share with you because it's perfect for the cold weather that we have now. Uh, then we'll talk about the benefits of eating local. So we'll go over five key benefits of local uh, foods and why I love eating local. So a little bit about my story and how I grew up. And then I'll go uh, over the stories of uh, three of my favorite uh, Saskatchewan producers. So those include uh, Pineview Farms, Splendor Garden uh, that uh, makes spices and Golden Eden that's a greenhouse close to Burr in Saskatchewan that um, grows tomatoes and peppers, spicy peppers and cucumbers. Um, then we can go to the next slide. So really my goal today is that you are inspired to try either one tip or one recipe. Uh, we don't boil the ocean, we're just trying to make little changes. And I really believe that we make changes at the macro level by just making small micro changes in our um, lives from day to day. And it's, it's just about the little steps. So let's keep the goal small and just try to find one tip or one recipe that inspires you. Next slide. So let's start with um, why reducing food waste is important. Next slide again. The Canada Food Price Report uh, came out just a few weeks ago, uh, which predicts an overall increase of food prices in 2022 uh, between five and 7%. So um, what does this mean uh, in terms of, uh, for a, a family of four? So, if we look at a family of four with a man uh, 31 to 50 years old, a woman between 31 and 50, a boy between 14 and 18, so a teenager, and then a girl between nine and 13, the annual increase in uh, food expenses for 2022 compared to 2021 is expected to be $966. So that's pretty significant. Um, if we look into the food categories that this is broken down into, um, bakery, the anticipated uh, percentage and increase is five to seven percent. Dairy is planned to is predicted to increase by six to eight percent. Fruit, three to five percent. Meat, zero to two, and that's good because it increased a lot last year. Um, restaurants are predicted to increase by six to eight percent. That's very significant. Um, seafood, zero to two percent, and then vegetables again, five to seven percent. So our biggest Growth are really in vegetables, fruits, uh, dairy, and bakery items. So um, that's where we really want to minimize our food waste because our food costs are really increasing in those categories. Um, there was a study that was conducted in 2014 by Value Change Management International, and they found that in Canada, the amount of preventable food waste that is discarded annually in Canada is worth over $31 billion. About 47% of food that's wasted at home, um, about 47% of the food is wasted at home. So it's a significant amount of food every year. Uh, in 2017, the National Zero Waste Council, they studied household food waste and they found that 63% of the food that we um, discard as Canadians could have been eaten. And this represents 140 kilos of food each year. And that's worth over uh, $1,100 of 
which, which is very significant. And it's encouraging in some way because if we reduce our food waste, we can um, mitigate some of the uh, increase in prices of food that we're seeing. So that's a really key motivator to decrease our food waste. Um, what do you think would be the most common food we waste in Canada? Would it be uh, meats or dairies or eggs? I, I was thinking it was going to be dairy because I always think of milk going bad. But um, the report found that the food that is most commonly wasted is vegetables. So 30% of the food we waste is vegetables. Afterwards is fruit with 15% of our waste. Then we have meal leftovers, 13%. Breads and bakings are 9% of our waste. And dairy and eggs are only 7%. So what does this mean in numbers? If we look at Canada-wide, how many tomatoes are we wasting? Well, the numbers are pretty staggering and a, a little scary, but we need to remember we make an impact at our small household level, but it, it becomes really big when it's multiplied over many families. So in Canada, currently we're wasting over 1.2 million tomatoes every day, over 2.4 million potatoes, three quarter of a million breads, uh, over half a million bananas, a million cups of milk, and almost half a million eggs. So it really adds up. And all those little things we throw up throughout, <laughs> they do add up. So it, it really does make a difference. Now let's move on to five tips to reduce food waste now that we're really motivated and, and want to reduce our food waste. Um, the first thing is let's look at our best befores. So when we're shopping in stores, um, it's important to double check the best before dates. And with some products, especially dairies, um, the, the, they tend to organize the shelves to ensure that the first foods that come in the store is the first one that is bought by customers. If you need a product that uh, like a, a jug of milk, for example, and you're not going to be able to drink in a few days, just look behind in the shelf. And usually you're able to find um, a, an ingredient or a food that has a later best before date. Um, so it's important to be uh, concerned and to take into consideration uh, when you think you're going to be able to finish that food buy. Now, once we get home, um, it's important to not look at the best before dates as bad after, right? So we don't throw away food simply because it's past the best before date. Uh, it's important to double check if the food is still good. Some food may still be good days, weeks, and even sometimes months after the best before date. So if we think of pasta, like dry ingredients, uh, grains, spices, um, it's really important to use our senses and determine whether that food is still good to eat. And now when we're looking at dairy products or more um, products that are a little more sensitive, um, like if we think of 0% uh, milk, sometimes those products, they go bad before the best before dates. And then we have other products like uh, whipping cream that goes bad sometimes past the best before dates. Uh, so I use the best before dates more as a guide and then I use my senses to decide when the food needs to be thrown out. Uh, second, we need to, um, it's important to focus on our, our planning. So if we make a weekly menu uh, with recipes and snacks uh, for the week before we go grocery shopping and we make sure to write a list with all the uh, foods we wanna buy, it's a lot easier to not buy too much. Uh, the grocery stores are often um, filled with foods that tempt us all along the way and there's all those little snacks that are positioned in very key strategic positions in the store uh, that encourage us to buy more than what we uh, initially intended to so with the list it's a little easier um, to stick to what we need and when we know that 45 percent of the food we waste are fruits and vegetables um, it's important to ensure that we uh, don't buy too much of, of those right we want to buy what we need or we buy in smaller quantities. When our schedule is unpredictable, um, it can be really valuable to buy in smaller quantities because that gives us more flexibility. If we don't like leftovers, I really recommend just making sure to uh, cook the right amount of food uh, to ensure that we don't just have leftovers that end up in the garbage uh, or freezing our leftovers as well is a good option. 
Next, another uh, tip is storing. So there's some foods that are very um, impacted by the way we store them. If we look at potatoes and onions, they will last a lot longer if in the pantry we keep them separate. There's some kind of chemical reaction when they're together um, where they last less, less time and they go bad a lot faster. Uh, afterwards, if we look at um, fruits like uh, avocado and mangoes, I know avocados, uh, usually I, I think of them as being good for 10 minutes. Uh, they, they are ripe and the next day they are brown. So as soon as they start to get ripe, it's important to uh, maybe store them in the fridge if we're not able to eat them right away because uh, putting them in the fridge is going to slow down the ripening process quite a bit. Uh, and that's the same thing with mango. Um, the next step is freezing and sharing. So if we make a big batch of, for example, a bolognese sauce or we cook a turkey, um, it's a good idea to portion and freeze it or to share it with friends. I find that um, if I make a really big batch of something and I, I don't freeze it and I don't share it, I just get tired of it. So a good way to make sure that those uh, delicious food don't get wasted um, is just to make sure we don't get tired of it. And next, the last tip is uh, being creative. So um, when we have a lot of food in the fridge that needs to be eaten now, and it's about to go, um, like it's gonna go bad if we don't cook it or do something with it right away. What I love to do is I go in the fridge, I look at all the different ingredients that I should be eating and I take them out, put them on the counter. And then I try to see if something creative is, uh, something is inspiring me. Um, so for example, sometimes if I have uh, asparagus, lemon, and zucchini, maybe I'll want to make a pasta with it. Um, so just looking at the ingredients together, sometimes it helps to like understand what flavor profile we can go with. And the other thing I love doing is um, if there's a few ingredients I really want to eat now, I will write those on Google uh, and write recipe. And then it's going to give me ideas of different types of recipes I could make with it. There's also um, types of recipes that are super flexible and they're really good um, to use with, when, with most food leftovers. Um, and in French, uh, we call those types of meal to skis. So it's kind of everything that's left. Um, so we can make, for example, uh, omelets or a quiche with um, leftover vegetables from the fridge or maybe like a spaghetti sauce. I don't know how many uh, carrots and celery I've saved by making big batches of bolognese sauce that I've frozen afterwards in Ziploc bags. Um, and pizzas are another good way of using extra vegetables that you have like mushrooms and uh, bell peppers. Now we can move on to the next slide. So now I want to talk to you about the happy fridge soup. So you might know this soup as the empty fridge soup. Just gave it a new name because I, I thought the empty fridge soup is not really appetizing. But we know that um, the food we waste at home is mostly vegetables, right? 30% of the food we waste is vegetables. So what's better to reduce our, our vegetable waste than making soup? Um, soups are super comforting and they help us reduce food waste. That soup recipe has saved many celery, carrots, and cabbages in my house. Um, and it's a very easy, flexible recipe to make. So we start with um, an onion. So the onion, it can be any other vegetable that you have that are in the same family as the onion. So it could be leeks, shallots, you can add garlic if you have it. Um, then a little bit of oil, potatoes, five cups of stock. So for potatoes, it's about two or three potatoes. It depends on how thick you like your soup as well. So it's um, easy to adjust after um, as well. Then salt and peppers and, uh, and pepper. And then you have five cups of vegetables. So that's where you um, get creative. You use what you have. It can be carrots, celery, rutabaga, broccoli, cauliflower, you name it. Everything is pretty good in those soups. Um, one thing I want to note about these styles of soup is um, I'm sure you've all heard of these soups ending up kind of a brownish color and not being super appetizing. Um, and there's a way to prevent that. So to ensure uh, our soups are pretty, it's important to divide them in color palettes. So um, there's 
basically three color palettes for soups. We have the orange, green, and white. Um, and we want to ensure that when we're making um, a green soup, we don't include any ingredients that would be in the orange category because green and orange uh, mix together as brown. And that's where, how we end up sometimes with um, not really pretty soups. With the orange soup, some vegetables we can use are carrots, squash, uh, pumpkin, sweet potatoes, maybe corn, um, green soups, spinach, uh, the green of our leeks, celery, zucchini, cabbage. Um, with white soup, we can use onion, potatoes, cauliflower, any other uh, white vegetable or even like a, a lighter green cabbage would work. Um, the ingredients that are kind of a whitish color can go in with either soups, the orange or the green. You just want to make sure not to mix the orange and the green ingredients. So to make this soup, we um, use a, a pretty big pot and we uh, soften our onion in the oil. We add our potato, our vegetables, uh, our stock, we add a little salt and pepper, we bring this to a simmer and we let it simmer for about 20 minutes. And then once that's done, we can uh, put everything in the blender. I love using blenders because it, it makes the soups very pretty um, and we reduce it in a, in a puree and then we re-add that uh, soup to our pot and we taste it, add a little salt and pepper if we need it and there we have it. Um, I also wanted to share with you a few tips on how to add extra flavors or give a twist to those soups. Um, with herbs and spices, we can really change the flavors of soups to make sure we don't get bored with them. Uh, with the uh, orange vegetable soup, I always love using flavors like ginger and turmeric. Um, and then another flavor combination is with curry and turmeric and as well a little uh, black pepper. Uh, black pepper um, has an interesting property where it activates the antioxidant properties of the turmeric, so it just makes it very healthy. Um, then with the green soups, I love uh, adding um, just like fresh green herbs like dill and maybe like Greek yogurt or a little pesto. And then we have our classic um, vegetable soup spices, our bay leaf, thyme, oregano, basil, those work with every every type of vegetables. Um, another thing we can add to give a little extra flavor to our soup is a Parmesan rind uh, when we're letting it simmer. So we just add the rind in the soup and then we remove it before blending and it adds tons of flavor. Um, now that we're talking about um, leftovers or soups uh, that empty our fridges, uh, we might as well talk about uh, delicious, crunchy, homemade croutons. So we can transform our sad leftover breads uh, in a delicious, um, in, in delicious croutons that would be perfect toppings for soups or salads. And those are very easy to make. We uh, take about four cups of um, leftover bread. It can be a baguette, um, any types of bread, like even buns. You just cut them into squares of about, about one inch squares. Um, and then you put those in a bowl, you add a tablespoon of oil and about a tablespoon of spices of your choice. You can use Italian spice, you can use um, a little garlic, even a little uh, Parmesan. It's really up to you and, and what you're feeling like that day. And then we mix all these together. We place the uh, croutons on a baking sheet and bake those at 375 for 15 minutes. And then we have uh, the perfect toppings for our soup. Now let's move on to um, the next slide. So let's talk about ways to reduce our food costs at home. So the price of beef and chicken increased a lot last year. So last fall, it was up by uh, 25 up to 25% compared to a year ago. So that's extremely high. Um, it has reduced since then, but it's still significantly higher than it was a year ago. Some cuts um, like chicken wings uh, for restaurants increased from $110 a case a year ago to over 185 this fall. Um, so there's, there's um, significant advantage in reducing our um, our meat expenses. 
Um, an interesting advantage of eating local foods is that uh, the price of meat for small artisanal uh, family farms that raise meat, um, their prices haven't increased over the last year. So places like Pineview Farms, uh, that's by Saskatoon, or the Bison Ridge Farms that, that's close to Prince Albert, um, their prices, only some of their prices increased by one to 2%, if at all, uh, compared to last year. So now um, some tips to reduce our bills is, we'll um, talk about using affordable cuts. So if we look at upper chicken thighs and stew meats, it's a lot less expensive than uh, chicken breasts and steaks, um, as well adding a vegetarian meal to a weekly menu is an option. And combining meats with plant-based protein also helps us save money. Let's go on the next slide. So using affordable cuts. So this is my bison uh, stew that I was telling you about earlier. Um, using affordable cuts, uh, is it makes a really big difference. Uh, chicken breasts and steaks are really the most expensive cuts. And by cooking with more affordable options, we can save up to 60%. So if we look, um, that was the, if, Late last year at a Sobeys in Regina, I looked at the prices of ribeye steaks. Um, they were $6.17 per 100 grams. Um, so if we compare that to beef stew in the same store, it was $2.20 for 100 grams. So we're saving significant amounts of money there. Um, now let's look at what's what the price difference if we're uh, going with the bison stew. Uh, bison stew um, that's raised locally, um, artisanally by family farms, um, it's $2.64 per 100 grams. So we're comparing 220 to 264. So 44 cents, um, it's the, the gap between uh, the price of locally really high quality foods uh, versus feedlot uh, meats is really closing and there's a lot of advantages in eating local. So I wanted to talk to you about this recipe. Uh, so this is a super easy recipe that we can make with whatever vegetables we have left. Uh, in this one, I've used butternut squash, onions, potatoes. And like I said earlier, this stew is going to warm you up, like really. So if, if you're getting cold and you eat this, there, there's definitely something to the meat. I don't know if it's how dense it is, but it's super filling and really warming. Um, so what we use to make it is six cups of varied vegetables, one large onion, one can of diced tomatoes, four cups of beef stock, two pounds of stew. Oh, let's just go back to the stew. <laughs> and then um, one cup of red wine, uh, some bay leaves and a parsley. And the instructions are we, um, we turn on the oven to 350 and then in a small bowl, we combine a little bit of flour with salt and pepper. Um, and then we roll all our cubes of, of uh, meat in that flour and then we um, brown all those, um, all that meat in our pot just to make sure it gets brown all around. Uh, and we wanna make sure it gets a nice color. So a good five minutes on each side um, and just make sure that they, they have like, some really nice, nice brown bits. Um, and then once the bison cubes are all brown, we add them to a Dutch oven and we add the red wine to the pan uh, just to get all those nice uh, juicy bits out. And then we add our vegetables and all the rest of our ingredients in our pot and we bake this in the oven at 350 for two and a half hours. Um, if you don't have time to, or you haven't had a chance to write all these um, steps and in the ingredients, don't worry, the recipe is on Zesty Kit's website um, and I'll, uh, I have the, the link for it uh, at the end here of the presentation. Let's go to the next slide. So the second tip to reduce our meat expense is to add a vegetarian meal to our weekly menu. Uh, some of the most comforting vegetarian dishes that I know are pasta. Uh, today I wanna share my favorite mac and cheese recipe. So this mac and cheese is amazing because um, it's ultra cheesy, it's super creamy, and then it's topped with crunchy panko. Um, so you have a lot of texture in there. The two secrets uh, to make this recipe really good is Really the cheese sauce is a bechamel sauce base. And then we add 
make a lot of cheese to it to make it extra cheesy, but the Bichamel sauce is super creamy by itself. And then we top it with panko and butter. Um, and that just adds that really crave worthy crunch uh, once we bite into it. The ingredients for this recipe are one pound of macaroni and salt. So that, that salt is just to salt our water. Um, then for the cheese sauce, we use a quarter cup of butter, a quarter cup of flour, a teaspoon of salt, two, ta uh, two cups of milk and two cups of uh, cheddar. So you can use whichever cheddar you prefer. Uh, I love using old cheddar. Uh, and then for our topping, we have a half a cup of panko and a quarter cup of butter. This recipe is ready in about 50 minutes and it's gonna serve six to eight people. So when we want to prepare it, we preheat our oven to 350 and then we butter a baking dish. Then we uh, bring our water to a boil to uh, cook our pasta. Then we make our cheese sauce. So while the macaroni is cooking, we melt the butter in a pot and we're really making the bichamel. So we melt the butter uh, in the pot. Then we add our flour, salt, and then we stir that on medium heat for about um, two or three minutes and that's just to make sure the flour is really cooked because we don't want the taste of flour in our sauce so we need to um, cook that for two to three minutes then we'll add the uh, milk slowly and whisking at the same time and then for about uh, we're going to keep cooking it for about five minutes once it starts to thicken uh, we can add all our grated cheese then we add our macaroni once it's cooked into our cheese sauce and we combine our panko with our butter to make our little topping. We put that over our macaroni and then we bake that in the oven until it's um, nice and bubbly around the edges and uh, brown and crunchy on top. So about 15 minutes um, at 350 just to get the top nice and crunchy. Let's move on to the next, um, next step. So our last step to reduce our meat expenses is really by combining meat with plant-based protein. So there's quite a few recipes, um, especially like Moroccan dishes um, and Mediterranean dishes that um, include the combination of um, a legume with meat, and that significantly reduces our meat expense. This Moroccan stew is absolutely delicious. It has very different flavors from the others too because of the American flavors we're talking about like uh, ginger spices, a little cinnamon, we have dried apricots. Um, so it's very, uh, it's very um, exotic as flavors. So the ingredients in this too are uh, one onions, three carrots, six uh, potatoes, two pounds of lamb, um, we have really good local lamb that's uh, raised here in Saskatchewan. Um, and then some garlic, three cloves of garlic, a half a cup of dried apricots, uh, one stick of cinnamon, one bay leaf, a half a teaspoon and a half of allspice, a half a teaspoon of ginger, and then a whole can of diced tomatoes, two and a half cups of beef broth, and a big can of chickpeas. So I'm not going to go in through all the details of the steps of this too. It's very similar to the first two. Uh, but if you want all the steps, you can go on Zesty Kit's uh, blog and you have um, all the details of the recipe there. Let's move on to the next slide. So let's talk about the benefits of eating local. What are the key benefits of eating local? So there's many. Um, I choose five to go over today. Um, the first one is it helps keeping money flowing in our community. So it helps um, also reduce the transportation miles to the market and reduce the food's carbon footprint. Um, the other key thing is flavor. So local food really tastes good. It's, it's grown locally. It's, it's been grown really close to us. And for example, the best carrots I know of that are available right now are the ones that comes from the other right colonies and all the little farms that we can find right now in our local markets. They're, they're sweet winter carrots. They're just absolutely amazing. I, I don't know of any better carrot. <laughs> then uh, the fourth tip is, uh, the fourth benefit is preserving regional food diversity and learning to cook with what grows here. And then uh, the last one is knowing where our food comes from. The stories, the why, the passion of those who grow it. 
we, we really learn through stories and knowing the stories of the food that we eat um, helps us uh, get a deeper appreciation for the food. So there's, there's many levels of benefits to eating local. Let's move on to the next slide. So with this slide, I wanna talk a little bit about my story and why I love eating local. Uh, these photos are not me or my family. They are my cousin's kids. Um, she has a little farm close to Prince Albert. And those are our two little kids. And um, they absolutely love uh, growing up around the farm and, and seeing the vegetables growing and the, the chicks when they hatch in the spring. And um, it just, the, the, the way my cousin is raising them really reminds me of how we were raised uh, when we were kids. So um, I grew up with a French background. Uh, my parents raised us with artisanally produced simple ingredients. We lived across the road from an artisanal vegetable and fruit farm, and we visited them uh, quite often to buy seasonal produce. They, they, our parents really promoted the importance of knowing where our food comes from, to eat the best quality ingredients produced as close to home as possible. They helped us understand that our health is our wealth. My parents always supported our artisanal farmers and producers, and they raised us with a deep respect for food and understanding the impacts it has on our personal health and on our community's health. Artisanal food production is really in my blood, my sister and my sisters. Uh, from the dairy farm on which my mother was raised to the strawberry field that my great uncle harvested until his 96th birthday, um, farming is, is really something that is a passion for me. Our, patient, our parents artisanally raised bees and chickens for a family and they dreamt of one day owning an artisanal farm. They value learning the stories of the farmers and producers behind each ingredient. Growing up, some of my best memories include uh, picking raspberries under the hot sun of June and picking apples with the cold breeze of September. I remember visiting artisanal farms, including cheese farm, vegetable farms, berries, honey, goats, and even an ostrich farm. <laughs> we fondly remember meeting the farmers, hearing their stories, meeting the animals, and even feeling the dirt between our toes if we walked bare feet in their, on their land, smelling the fresh air, tasting the delicious food, Food really nourishes more than our bodies. It nourishes our soul and it nourishes our community. I believe that supporting local farmers is supporting our health. If we are what we eat, understanding where our food comes from and valuing high quality local foods is a priority. Have you heard of Jen Sharp? She wrote a book on local producers. Uh, this is our book, uh, Flat Out Delicious. Um, in her book, she talks about uh, the importance of eating local and she's extremely passionate about local producers. Um, and one of the quotes in her book that really stands out to me is, um, I believe the key factor when it comes to personal health, sustainability and community economic health is the way our food is grown, raised and how far it travels. I really, um, I love this quote because it really puts the importance onto um, the quality of the food we eat and how close to home it is grown. I encourage you to be curious about the history of your food. Similarly to many other important choices that we make, such as who's our trainer, uh, who's gonna be our hairdresser, house builder, or insurance company, our daily food choices have a significant impact and they have a significant impact on our personal health and on our community's health. I encourage you to think of food not just as fuel for your body, but as an investment in our health and our communities. These small daily choices are building Saskatchewan's vibrant food future. And um, I'm really excited to share this passion with you today. So now let's talk about some of my favorite uh, local food producers. Next slide. So um, Pine View Farm uh, is one of my favorite uh, meat producer in Saskatchewan. Uh, Melanie and Kevin that you see there on the photos with their um, sons are the 
owners of Pine View Farms. Their farm, um, their, their products are mainly meat, so chicken, beef, pork, fish. Uh, they are located close to um, Ulcer and Warman in Saskatoon. Uh, my favorite product from them is their smoked chicken and their beef and pork meatballs. They're absolutely amazing. <laughs> Uh, Melanie and Kevin Bolt and their family own the Pine View Farms. Kevin's great-grandfather settled on that land in 1901 with his wife and 18 children. It's quite big families back then, eh? I, I just love uh, that farm. I visited it a few times with Annie. Uh, and the, the farm that you see there in the, in the photo isn't used anymore for livestock, but it's exactly the image I, I always have in my head when I think of a a family farm. All of Pine View Farms poultry and livestock are raised in humane, low stress environments on an el a healthy vegetarian diet without the use of growth promoting medication or hormones. The farm follows an all natural protocol and is certified through the on farm food safety assurance program for free range production to emphasize health, cleanliness and safety through every step of the animal's life. Most importantly, Pineview Farm is customer verified. So they encourage their customers to come and visit the farm, ask questions and learn about the day-to-day -day activities. Um, when I visited them a few times, we saw them uh, pro um, um, processing meat. So we saw them pro process uh, their chicken, their pork, uh, even smoke some of the meat. So you, you get to see the whole process when you go. The Bolts believe you deserve the simple pleasures of eating good food grown well. They believe in the importance of knowing where your food comes from and where it is produced. Pine View Farms are, an environment, are environmentally responsible and they're socially positive. As Kevin and Melanie explain, they say, our farm is a personal reflection of who we are and what we believe. We are on a journey of making, to making meat better and we thank you for joining us along the way. So with this goal, you can really see their passion uh, for high quality products. And it just motivates me to uh, want to be part of that journey with them. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, my second favorite producer is Splendor Garden. Uh, what their products are are spices and they're based in Watson, Saskatchewan. My favorite products uh, from them is kind of hard to decide because I kind of love every spice, but with Splendor Garden, they have a very special uh, Greek spice blend, I find. It has a, a lot of lemon zest and a little mint and some other secret ingredients in there that uh, it makes it taste way better than any other Greek seasoning spice I've ever had. So their, their Greek spice is definitely my, my favorite. Splendor Garden started in 2012 after Colleen, who's the co-founder, the founder you see here. Uh, she uh, went through a life-changing battle with breast cancer. Spices made Colleen's meals a lot more appetizing and they're packed with antioxidants and other nutritional benefits. And that's what inspired her to make her own organic um, flavors, spices, herb and seasoning blend. Through Splendor Garden, she enables others to make healthy choices with satisfying ingredients they can feel good about eating. Colleen's favorite product is uh, the smoked paprika, and she, um, she uses it on everything, she says. She loves to put it on chicken, fish, potatoes, veggies. Sometimes she mixes it with garlic, garlic granules, uh, garlic powder, sometimes with um, gar uh, onion powders. And so she combines it with, with many different ones and it's, it's really her favorite spice. Let's move on to the next producer. So the next producer is um, Golden Eden and one of the co-founder is Maureen that you see there. Uh, their produce are, um, so they have a greenhouse and they grow tomatoes, cucumber, bell peppers, uh, spicy peppers too. And they're located in Burr. So that's, kind of, it's a few hours from Saskatoon and Regina. And they are a farming family, which, um, so they, they produce, yeah, their bell peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers. They offer Saskatchewan fresh, wholesome foods um, for the table, which is locally grown, not GMO and pesticide free. 
Golden Eden is tucked away from the prairies in the middle of a hayfield on their original family homestead. And it's in that peaceful surrounding of the farm that their greenhouses are built. And Golden Eden is a little bit of an oasis for their fresh vegetables in the harsh climates of Saskatchewan. Their vegetables are good um, for, they, they're basically closed for just a few months every year. And Golden Eden, um, they don't use any pesticides. They bring in friendly bugs to eat the pests that could damage or destroy the crop. So this gives their produce a very special flavor that's devoid of any pesticide, pesticides uh, residue um, that would otherwise be unconventional produce. So you have a very high quality, clean product uh, from there. Their products are available in many grocery stores as well um, as um, local um, kind of local grocery stores like SAS made or local and fresh in Regina. Let's move on to uh, how we find local foods. So there's many different ways of finding local producers and where to like where to buy all this local food. Um, one of my favorite ways is to contact them directly. So in um, Jen's book um, here, Flat Out Delicious, um, she talks about hundreds of different producers and they're divided in um, different regions in Saskatchewan. I'm just going to find an example here. Ah. So we have different regions of Saskatchewan. So example, this is West Central. And then there's a number of different producers that are listed um, in different um, categories. So you have the meats, you have restaurants, you have um, prepared foods, vegetables, even some little grocery stores. And by finding them here, you can go and find them online and then contact them directly if you wanna know um, about, you have a specific question or you wanna to get to know them, understand their stories. And every time I've done that, people are super happy to, to share their stories and, and they want people to, to know their passion, Cook, making, growing food and, and talking about food is, is really their passion. So they love, they love to share it. Um, the next place is farmer's market. That's another great way of meeting the producers. Um, they also have websites where you can go and buy uh, foods online and have it delivered in Regina and Saskatoon. I know they have that available um, currently. And then there's also the local grocery stores. Um, so in Regina, we have local and fresh. Um, those grocery stores are kind of like a regular grocery store, but they focus on local products. So they're kind of like a farmer's market into one building. So in Regina, we have Local and Fresh. In Saskatoon, we have Sask Made, uh, Mooshja Wandering Market. There's probably uh, some other ones that I'm forgetting, but those are some of the, the ones I know about. Um, then we can go online to buy products as well. So uh, if we want bison, um, the Bison Ridge Farm um, sells their products online as well. And um, there's the Wooten Farm that's in Lumsden that sells lamb, pork, and chicken. Um, actually, their lamb is a pretty decent price. For stew, it's only $10 a pound. So uh, it's pretty reasonable. Then we have the Pine View Farms with um, all their, their beef, pork, and chicken. Uh, you can also find honey and there's Every producer, almost every producer has a website and then uh, most of them lets you buy um, online. Let's move to uh, the next slide. So we're on to our conclusion. Um, so today we discussed uh, why reducing food waste at home is important. We briefly went over the key predictions of the 2022 Canada Food Guide um, price report. We talked about five different tips to reduce food waste by uh, being careful with our best before, uh, storing our foods, um, like our potatoes, not with our onions, planning our menu and writing our grocery list, uh, freezing and sharing when we have too much, and being creative with our leftovers. We also talked about um, the happy fridge soup, and we know now how to not make a brown soup, know how to separate our, our uh, green vegetables from our orange ones. Uh, then we talked about easy tips to reduce our meat expenses. Uh, meat increased a lot in the last year, but 
Um, with local foods, the, the price of local meat barely, if at all, increased in the last year. So we have more and more advantages of buying local and supporting our local producers. And we also talked about three tips to reduce our meat expenses by using more affordable cuts, incorporating vegetarian meals into our weekly menu, and combining meats with plant-based protein for um, delicious Mediterranean dishes like the Moroccan chickpea stew lamb and chickpea stew. Then we talked about benefits of eating local um, and three Saskatchewan food producers, uh, the Pine View Farm, Splendor Garden, and Golden Eden. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, my goal was that after today you try uh, one of the tips we discussed or maybe one recipe. So let's go on the next slide. So yeah, here are some, uh, some inspiration uh, photos. If some of those recipe inspire you, uh, I really encourage you to try them. If you're curious about uh, any of the, the producers, um, I encourage you to uh, reach out to them and, and talk to them and understand their stories. And next slide. And here are some resources I wanted to share with you. So for the recipes that we discussed today, all of the recipes are on uh, the Zesty Kits blogs. Um, so they're um, the meat, all the, the meat saving recipes are in one blog and then we have the soup as well. So all the recipes we discussed are there. Uh, then the Canada Food Price Report, if you want to learn a little bit more about the increases that are predicted for 2022, here is the link for that. And then I, if you want to learn more about local producer, I strongly recommend this book from uh, Jen Sharp. She has also um, a series on City TV. She just finished filming her season two. And she uh, films with some of the producers that are in this book. So uh, it's great to get to know those producers maybe a little bit. Um, and uh, I strongly recommend this book. There's over 200 Saskatchewan producers that are featured in here with wonderful photos and maps and it's, it's great. So next slide. And that's it for today. I really wanted to thank you uh, again for inviting me to this Sustainability Speaker Series. It's really been a pleasure to be here. All right. Um, perfect. Thank you. I have hidden my self view, so I cannot see myself currently. I'm assuming everyone else can, but. We'll just pop out the chat. And I think there's a couple questions already sitting there that I can throw your way and while other people put some in. Um, so the first question was, uh, can you provide any insight on using kitchen scraps? I have tried this, but it wasn't very tasty. Do you have any go-to advice for that person? What, what does she mean, kitchen scraps? Um, I'm not sure specifically. It could be anything that is left over after the cooking. Um, oof, I don't have anything that comes to mind right now um, on how to use. Well, okay, so for example, um, I have uh, an example of recipes that we can make with um, a leftover of mashed potatoes, for example. So one of my favorite ways of using leftover mashed potatoes, and that works really well uh, during Thanksgiving time and Christmas when we have turkey as well. Um, I love making little croquettes. Um, so I use mashed potatoes, um, finely diced onion, leftover chicken. It can be fish as well. And then I make um, little balls with the mashed potatoes and the chicken. And then I roll those into an egg uh, mixture and then panko and then I kind of smush them a little bit like burger patties and bake them in the oven uh, at about 400 for 20 minutes until they're nice and golden. Um, so that's one of my favorite way of eating leftover mashed potatoes. Uh, with leftover gravies, I love to just add those into soups or sometimes transform them into a pasta dish. So for example, like a beef stroganoff is a perfect fit to use a leftover uh, gravy. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so those are some of the kitchen scraps I can think of. <laughs> I think I have more information in the chat. They were talking about like tops of carrots, potato skins, tops of celery, the stuff that you oh, like you, know, you chop off great. before you cook. And also no egg in the croquette. For the There's egg on the top. Oh, okay. So I, I kind of coat them in the egg and then I coat them in the panko so the egg makes the panko stick. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, um, with the, like leftover, uh, skins of vegetables, um, well, we can do composting with that. That's something I'm, I'm learning <laughs> more about. Um, but I also love using, um, like the ends of onions and the ends of vegetables to make stocks. So, um, yeah, that's it. Homemade stocks smells amazing. It tastes amazing. It's one of the best ways to use those little ugly ends of vegetables. I've definitely done that. Um, it, it's, you ha kind of have to have a good chunk of time or a slow cooker, like, cause it just boils for hours, but it does smell so good. <laughs> Love it. Chicken soup with homemade stock is heavenly. <laughs> well, and now I'm showing my hand a little bit. If you cook couscous, you need stock to fluff up mm -hmm. the grain. So I, you know, make the vegetable side dish for the couscous and then the scraps are the stock. It's sort of a net zero kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. And then you get all the, the vitamins from all those, those vegetables. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. I'm a big make your own stock fan. Me and uh, my friend have a soup club. Nice. You soup swaps. This isn't about me. If anyone has other questions they have for Catherine, please throw them into the, the chat. Yeah, the uh, soup club sounds interesting. I, what's the favorite, what's the best soup you've made there? Oh, um, I make a very good borscht. Mm -hmm. And my friend has this very good, so far, her lentil and carrot soup. It's got a great blend of spices that she's just perfected so oh, yeah. it makes me hungry <laughs> yes and we also use a lot of soup puns in our club <laughs> it's super. Me. Me. <laughs> uh, another question can you please provide more information about splendor garden do you know if they have if they're in local establishments or do you just order online through um, so they're available basically everywhere. Um, they're in, well, not everywhere, but they're in Sobeys. They're in all the local um, grocery stores like um, Sassmade and Local and Fresh. Um, I'm not sure if they're at Wandering Market, but I'm pretty sure they are. Um, they're also available online. You can buy um, on their website. Uh, you can also buy on Amazon. So if you have a yes. Prime membership, you can just get, get it the next day. I did. I took a quick look at their website and um, yeah, they didn't have a list of local places, but that's good to know too, that you can, you can order. They use Amazon um, for their online orders. Yeah. Uh, do you have a source for the names of the meat producers, the other meat producers besides Pine View? The, anywhere on your blog or um I so I do have a blog on the blog where we talk about the stews I do talk about other um other producers so there's the lamb producer the wooden farm in Lumsden uh and then there's the bison ridge farm that I discuss in this blog uh, but in this book there's a lot of meat producers. There's, there's over 50 and they're all across Saskatchewan. You get to know their stories um, and what they, what they raise. So there, there's quite a few uh, all over Saskatchewan. The other, I have seen, check out that book. It's a lovely book. Mm -hmm. There are many available copies through the library. If you wanna check it out, um, you can just send me a private message and I'll, I can do that for you right now. Um, there's only one available copy in Saskatoon, mm -hmm. but there are 23 province-wide that we mm -hmm. can put a hold on. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I can talk about another book if somebody wants um, an inspirational story. 
about a local um, food story. This is a book by Jenny Oliver. It's called The Stop. And in this book, they talk about the story of a community, a low income community and how they have used local food to transform their communities. And they um, did like all kinds of, they, they did gardens and like, cooking events and all kinds of activities all around food. And they really transformed their community through local foods. And it's all like, it's all starting small and, and growing as a community. So if you're looking for an inspiring story. Excellent. I love a book, good book recommendation. Um, this is a, a Gen Sharp recommendation. <laughs> it's great. Excellent. Um, looks like we're winding down. Not uh, No more questions popping up. Lots of thank yous. So uh, thank you so much for coming. And um, I think, Carol, if you wanted to rejoin, we can talk about the next um, session.